The next panel is on music, AI, and ethics, and I'm going to introduce the moderator. Adam Banks is a committed teacher, midnight believer, and slow jam in a hip-hop world. Adam Banks is the professor and faculty director of the program in writing and rhetoric in the Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford. He also serves in his, as an affiliate faculty member in the program in African and African American Studies with me and Science and Technology and Society. He's currently working on his fourth book, Black Intranets, Dimensions of African American Digital Rhetoric. Please welcome him. Well, the great thing about being a facilitator is that I get to bring up our wonderful guests and get out of the way. So please allow me to present, present Anongo Lumumba Kasongo, who's an assistant professor of music on AI and hip hop at Brown. We have Brown well represented. Please bring her up with some applause, everybody. And Douglas Eck, who is senior researcher at Google. Please welcome him as well. Hi, everyone. I'm going to start my timer because I can be very long winded. Okay. So, I would like to begin um, by thanking Michelle, James, Casey, and the wonderful staff, and everyone who's spoken thus far. This has been an incredible experience. I'm a newbie in this space, so um, I really have just been absorbing all of these conversations. I have so much to think about. Um, so I want to, oops, sorry. There we go. Um, I want to start with this image of Samus, the video game character from which I took my rap name, and myself in cosplay, which I occasionally perform in. Like many other rappers, I'm wrestling with many of the same questions about cultural appropriation, gatekeeping, and ownership, lack thereof, within the music industry that have long activated conversations about the futures of black music. And I want to stress how complicated these issues are for so many of us within the universe of hip hop music, an art form that was birthed from the unlawful sampling and specifically for me as someone who has built a life through my adoption and revision of the Nintendo character Samus. I added an extra M so Nintendo didn't sue me. I was surprised when in 2014 I dropped a concept album about the video game Metroid, Samus is the main character of this game, through which I made beats using the soundtrack as samples and I was somehow able to successfully clear the tracks through my publishing by suggesting that I split 50% of the proceeds with the original composer Hirokazu Tanaka. Another friend of mine, Mega Ran, became one of the first rappers to be licensed by the video game developer Capcom through a similar act of asking for forgiveness for sampling the soundtrack of Mega Man rather than permission. So I speak of this because it's complicated, right? Like I'm coming from a space where we are kind of aesthetically pulling from what's available, making from what's available, and now speaking into the world of AI where we're having many of those same concerns about what ownership and copyright means. So for my 10 minutes, I'd like to quickly share how I found my way into questions about AI and hip hop performance before sharing what I've observed in my limited research. Again, I'm not an expert, just an MC who loves the culture and wants to think about what's next. Um, so I already uh, alluded to uh, my love of video games, and through connections with gaming communities online, I was hired by Glow Up Games, a new women of color-led game studio led by my dear friends Latoya Peterson and Dr. Mitsu Kendeker to work on their first project, a mobile game for the scripted HBO series Insecure. Um, as many of you know, uh, Insecure was created by Issa Rae, in 2016 and has developed a kind of cult-like following for its rich depictions of black millennial life through its story, cinematography, and soundtracks. One of the signatures of Insecure soon became the scenes in which Issa Rae would rap to herself in the mirror to express her interiority, her frustrations she might have with the world, love affairs she's thinking about. We decided that this was the feature we wanted to build the game around. And so I was tasked with helping to develop a rap composition tool that allowed players to pick from a menu of possible rhyme topics using words they had collected through the open world story part of the game, organize the words in decks, and deploy the words in time with the beat to construct rhymes and rhyme schemes for points. So many questions emerged for us before we even started. 
we knew we wanted for players to be able to represent themselves in the game, given our own fraught experiences with lack of representation in the games we played, but that also meant that many different kinds of players would be seeing themselves in rap. That led us to ask what kinds of language will players be allowed to perform in the game? Will the character be voiced? Can we account for voice? Um, other questions, what does it mean to win in rap composition and performance? Can we reconcile the space between rap as it might be read on the screen and as it's sounded? So my first task uh, after kind of working through these questions was to help, um, was to look at how other developers and artists had dealt with rap composition and synthesis. So it seems I stepped into the arena at just the right time because over the past few years, a range of different tools have emerged that I'll now quickly work through, some of which have already been discussed, including Drake AI and um, all of those, those super creepy tools. Um, so this is not comprehensive, but I just want to name a few kind of um, uh, tools that have emerged. So Deep Beat is one. Um, it was developed in 2015, uh, calling itself the first ever artificial intelligence rap um, developed by researchers um, from Finland and mining data from rap songs. The database takes individual lines from um, 641,000 lines uh, of different rap songs, 12,500 12, rap songs to be exact, um, and kind of organizes them together uh, to form not a very coherent story, but each line sort of makes sense as an individual unit. Um, Nabil Hassaim, who was already mentioned, I believe, uh, as a, a technology, technologist, educator, and organizer, he developed a tool uh, called Generative Doom in uh, 2018, which draws on the catalog of the idiosyncratic, brilliant uh, MC MF Doom, um, and creates these kind of rhyme schemes that are very nonsensical, but draw from the cat from the. Um, uh, vocabulary of MF Doom, so you can see, I think the text is a little bit small, but the, the rhyme that's, the couplet that's generated there says, and line got more the jiggy cartoon torch, Ghidorah will be him, I work on drawers done goon porch. Don't know what that means, but um, it's all pulling from the vocabulary of this artist, and when you hit the, um, the rhyme button, more couplets will sort of populate um, the screen. Um, the Hip Hop Poetry Bot uh, AI research is an AI research project um, that's in development and that I, I came across as having launched in 2021. Um, and it's still very much in development, but um, the question of can AI rap was being posed by this researcher who is in collaboration with Google Arts and Culture. Um, and I think they're still working on building a data set to bring this project to life. Um, and the project that kind of really activated my desires to speak out in this space is UberDuck AI, um, which is a text-to-speech synthesis tool. Um, many of you may have encountered it through a performance of Bohemian Rhapsody that was done using a vocal deepfake of Kanye West. It was viral, it was sort of circulating. Um, and it sounds very, you know, fairly convincing. It's a fairly convincing performance of Kanye West performing, speaking the lines of the, the first chunk of Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, and upon hearing that deep fake, I decided enough was enough, and I authored an article for Public Books um, about my growing concerns about this development of, in April of last year. And I'm not pretending to be the first scholar to be concerned about these issues. I'm definitely thinking about, um, sorry, I'm moving past. Um, the work of scholars like Ruha Benjamin, who in her notable book, Race After Technology, calls attention to the ways that hip hop can imbue AI with a kind of cool that might obscure the ways that its use may harm many of the same communities that hip hop emerges from and speaks to. Um, so I have this, this quote up here um, from the text. What better aesthetic than a black hip hop artist to represent AI as empowering, forward thinking, cool, the antithesis of anti-black discrimination. Not to mention that as an art form, Hip hop has long pushed the boundaries of technological experimentation through beatboxing, DJing, sampling, and more. One could imagine a corporate sponsored rap battle between artists and AI coming to a platform near you. Um, I also uh, think about, many of you will have heard of this as well, um, all of the recent developments around the uh, first signed AI rapper, FN Mecca, uh, a figure that for many of us was the manifestation of a centuries long desire on the part of white audiences to take part in black expression without having to deal with the problem of actual black people and bodies. 
Um, I also think about the work of uh, Matthew D. Morrison, an, an, an incredible uh, scholar, a musicologist. Um, and I'm thinking about the ease with which creators and developers have co-opted and presented the voices of many black hip hop artists like Kanye West, Jay-Z, now we see Drake, Travis Scott added, added to that list. And I think he would argue that this represents the latest development in a history of uh, black sound, which is a term he developed to speak to the sonic and embodied legacy of blackface performance as the origin of all popular music, entertainment, and culture in the US. So we have to be thinking about this when we're thinking about the ease with which creators embody these particular MCs and these artists and circulate um, their uh, likeness. Um, so there's certainly an argument to be made that formally rap music has become important for this kind of work, in part because rap songs contain more speech data per line than songs of other genres, um, which I noted in, in the article that I wrote, right? There's a lot of information per line that makes it, uh, renders it kind of vulnerable for um, extraction and, and um, thinking about how language works. And I want us to think about the broader histories of how black artists and artistry have operated and been operationalized within this country. Hip hop's place as pop music over the past 20 years. I, I want us to um, consider what's happening again with artists like Frank Ocean, Drake, um, and I, I, again, don't have to reiterate, I think what we're all sensing um, is disturbing about AI Drake, so I'm not gonna play the track right now in the interest of time. Um, but I wanted to conclude by thinking about some of the feedback that might be possible um, with AI systems, things that I'm thinking about um, specifically in regard to this conversation that we've had today, like what are the possibilities for the space? Um, and so I will end by sharing a rhyme that I asked OpenAI to write in the style of Samus myself. Um, what emerged was a very basic verse, um, and it's absent of any kind of significant storytelling or abstraction, but it did provide me with a kind of silhouette or shadow of how my work is perceived broadly. So I'll, I'll read the, the lines in the, um, in the song. In the game, and I'm feeling the beat, rhyming fast and I'm moving my feet. My style is unique and I'm pushing the boundaries. Hip hop, video games, and tech, that's my specialties. Got my headphones on and I'm in the zone. Words flowing out and I'm never alone. Telling my story and I'm speaking my truth. Not gonna stop until I see my proof. I'm a geek, These are, this is bad. I'm a geek and I'm proud of it. Making music and loving it. I'm Samus and I'm changing the game, bringing diversity and I'm not ashamed. From Ithaca to the world, my voice is heard. Breaking barriers and smashing the words. I'm a warrior and I'm fighting for justice. My flow is sharp and my rhymes are disgustingly robust. I'm <laughs> That's not, that's not terrible. Um, I'm Samus and I'm here to stay. My beats are banging and I'm slaying every day. So get ready for the future because I'm leading the way and I'm never gonna stop. So make way for the next display. Yikes. Um, so <laughs> I'm curious about how this silhouette might shift as I create new works and it's provided an interesting frame for me to see how, how my work is circulating broadly, but I'm curious about um, sort of what exactly it says about me as an MC. So with that, I will leave it to uh, the next guest. Um, thanks, Anungo. Thanks, Adam. Um, <clears throat> I took the bait and did not prepare slides, so you'll have to actually listen to me speak. I can do some TED Talk-like moves if that helps. Um, so first I want to say that the, uh, this event has been one of the best day-long events I've been to, like I think ever, not post-COVID, but ever, so massive round of applause. <laughs> for Michelle, for James, for Casey, and everyone that made this happen. I, I haven't been bored for a second, and I'm like an undiagnosed ADHD kind of sort of guy. So I just think this has been really meaningful in all sorts of ways. Far too much has happened to s uh, summarize. Um, a couple of things that stood out for me. Um, I thought that Steve's uh, line, ethical instincts of a hyena, was like the best. <laughs> but, but now we have, I have to read this, Gordita Crunch Wrap from Sydney. And so, it's, it's, you know, think that. And I also just want to throw something in from, uh, Ken mentioned white men dancing. Uh, I actually think it's more about old men dancing, to be honest. And I say this because I was about 40 years old at a wedding and I was dancing and like I was rocking and I was dancing really well. I wasn't even biting my lower lip. And um, someone came up to me and said, you know, there was this, this like uh, evolutionary biology study that showed that uh, 
that basically like there may be some story about like people not dancing the same way when they get older. It's it's a cue so that young people don't try to breed with you. Like like you're giving like you're giving yourself away. Like you can't fool anybody at the wedding, right? Because you know tiny changes in how your body works are actually really really keenly picked up on. I don't know if that's true or not, but I thought it was really funny. Um, okay, so uh, quickly a little bit about me. Not a lot. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. I, I was working with recurrent neural networks uh, in 2001 trying to generate sort of bad blues improvisation. And I just kind of cared about this space of AI and music for a long time. Um, I uh, drifted over to Google and started a, a project called Magenta that I'm very proud of. Um, it's still up and running. And well, we'll come back to that. Um, I now um, am, a, am a lead on the Brain team, which just merged with DeepMind. So now we're called Google DeepMind. And I've been invested in generative AI across the board, not just music. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I want to add to some layers to what Anongo said. Uh, if you saw me taking notes, I wasn't checking my mail. I was listening very carefully and, and jotting a couple of things down. Um, you know, I, we heard about cultural appropriation and representation. Um, and I, I just thought, just as like a thought experiment, just to echo um, the chat GPT Samus piece that you generated, what would it feel like if I had generated it and I read it to you? Even with her sitting on stage, maybe even with her consent, right? The idea of like taking other people's voices and playing with them, even in like a, in a kind of a fun way, like it's really it's really very serious. And I also loved all the discussion about um, <clears throat> bodies, right? So we learned we discussed voices, like voice cloning, and is 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 really tricky. Um, I think faces and face recognition and face generation is really tricky. And then we even you know heard earlier about hands being quite tricky. So. So this is a really loaded space, right? This is a really difficult space for us to work in. Um, I want to add a layer to the discussion about ethics. And this layer is about um, innovation cycles and how cultural change follows innovation cycles and waves. Um, so this is more about ideas like future of work, about protecting our IP rights, uh, directions like that. And um, a couple of examples come to mind. One of them, I think, <clears throat> is pretty straightforward. It's the internet, right? There was a point in time where the internet didn't exist. Imagine that, right? There was a point in time when it was DARPANET. There was a point in time when the Netscape Navigator happened. And, and I would argue that we're about at Netscape Navigator right now with, with, with this wave of, of generative AI. And I would remind everybody that it's, it's very hard to read the future. And when, when, when point changes happen that will affect culture and society, it's even harder to read the future. So like five years ago, I felt like as an AI researcher, um, I would have called myself a machine learning researcher then. I don't actually like the term AI, but I give up. It's going to be called AI. Um, you know, as an AI researcher, I felt like probably three years ahead of everybody else that doesn't do it, just because I care and they don't. But like now, everything tightens up, right? I heard some very, very intelligent conversations from non-researchers about ChatGPT, and not just about the uses of it, like how it works. So like now that it's important, like, there's a lot of energy being poured into the system. That energy in the system creates a higher variance kind of world, high energy world. And so I think it's really hard to predict the future. Um, <clears throat> the other one that comes to mind, and I think is a little bit more uh, appropriate, is um, talkies. You know, talkies are, right? These are like movies that make sound, right? Like microphones on stage. So if you go back and look at the history of talkies, that is the transition from silent film to the film that we know now, You'll read all of the common tropes, um, you know, don't like it, don't want it, blah, 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 that's fine. Um, we've talked about that a lot. But you'll also realize that, like, there was a generation of very talented actors that happened to be at the peak of their career who could not adapt. And it hurt their careers a lot, right? And so what I would say is, you know, I think t these, technological, these technological advances are waves, right? But it's maybe better to think about them as avalanches. Because like on this mountain, if, you're, if there's an avalanche on Wednesday, you're in pretty good shape if you were hiking on Tuesday, right? And you might even be in pretty good shape if you're hiking on Thursday. But look out if you're hiking on Wednesday, right? And so I think we need to take a sp special care for, for the stakeholders in this space as we absorb this technology into our lives and hopefully do something interesting with it. So I had just a couple examples that I wanted to, uh, to bring up, um, really just two vignettes that talk about um, this balance of future work against creative play. Um, the first one was an article by Rachel Metz. Rachel, are you still here? 
I might not have cited her if I didn't know she was going to be in the room. I might have just taken the story. Um, so maybe some of you have seen this article. Uh, she talked to some artists uh, about uh, uh, text to image. And she interviewed an artist named Aaron Hansen. And I want to read the quote. Um, <clears throat> Rachel generated the prompt oil painting of crystal light in the style of Aaron Hansen. Light and shadows, backlit trees, strong outlines, stained glass, modern impressionist, award-winning, trending on art station, vivid, high definition, high resolution. Nice prompt, Rachel. And uh, the text goes on in the article. Um, Rachel, or rather, Aaron looks at the, uh, the art output. And she says, wow, um, that one with the purple flowers and the sunset definitely looks like one of my paintings, you know? Right? And then she said, but wow, I'd put that on my wall. And so like, like, I think there's in the article, there are plenty of artists who are rightfully upset and angry. What struck me about, about Aaron's comment was it was more of like shock. Like, whoa, I didn't think this was possible. Didn't realize that putting my images online in relatively low resolution could be picked up by a model and generate this thing that's, that's even I would agree is interesting. And so I think there's a real sensitivity to have there just in, in people just not absorbing and understanding what's even possible with this technology. Um, and that resonates for me both as an AI researcher and as a musician myself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an Ongo, I'm not Samus, but I have about eight songs up on SoundCloud. They're awesome. <laughs> kind of like post-punk bluegrass written in my 20s. But, um, you know, I can make fun of myself, but you know what? They're mine. They're mine. I wrote them. <laughs> and I don't know how I'd feel if someone, like, grabbed them and, and did something with them. I mean, I might be like, oh, that's kind of cool because I'm not attached to them financially. But I also think I might be really offended and really upset about it. So, you know, those of us that are working in this space, a lot of AI researchers working in this space are also creatives themselves. And, and so, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, basically we're, we're at the table with everyone trying to figure this out. And then on the, on the flip side from, from Rachel is just observing that, okay, show of hands, Dada bots. Who knows what Dada bots is? Only one hand. It's one word, D-A-D-A-B-O-T-S. You're losing like a whole layer of meaning in your life by not having listened to Databots already. I will read exactly what is on their page. An AI death metal band emulating musicians dead or alive with neural networks were a couple of weirdo metalhead noise musicians who met at Berkeley College. And like if you meet them, their attitude is perfect. They're not see their, their stuff is low res. It's them. It's theirs. They train their own models. They're doing everything you should hope, right? They're really, really cool. And so you have like this balance of one artist who's taken blindsided, frankly, Aaron, by this technology. You have another artist, uh, the, the Databots guys, who have leaned into it and are doing something cool with it. And I think there's, there's room for both of those stories to, to exist at the same time. And our challenge is to understand what's in the messy middle. Um, so things are evolving fast. Um, I think I made a lot of my main points already. I want to leave room for conversation. But one more closer that I want. Um, it's hard to believe how fast things have moved. So I started Magenta in 2016. And if you want to find it, it's just search for Google Magenta. You'll find your way. And in fact, we launched at the, the same gray area event that Blaze mentioned this morning. Um, and our question at the beginning, uh, in the very first blog post, um, is asking basically, can AI models create something interesting and useful for art? And it was an open question in 2016. Like, really, maybe, maybe not. But by 2018, two years later, we'd already pivoted. It was already clear to us with Transformer that there was, there was like, expressive value or expressive power, and we immediately pivoted to talk about um, AI for artistic agency. Um, so things are moving fast. Um, I'm interested also in the, because they're moving so fast, watching culture absorb these things. Um, I love the term uh, hangover. I, frankly, I already have a show of hands, text to image. How many of you are blown away by like rando, I made an AI text to image thing and I'm gonna share it on Twitter? I'm, I'm very bored by that already. <laughs> like I think it's just lost, it's, it just, just doesn't, it just, it's not interesting in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> uh, at the same time, you know, I'm hopeful that we can actually turn this into something sane, turn this into something useful. I mean, maybe we will see some sort of marketplaces emerge that will connect artists with content creators like Steve who want, who want to voluntarily be part of an ecosystem where they build generators of their art to extend their style and then are you know, paid paid for that, right? It's, it's a marketplace. Maybe we can get there. Um, and, and then I would um, sort of close with the idea that just whether that ex exists, ha happens or not, I think it's an open question and a very risky one. I want to highlight that, that it's not a zero-sum game. Art is not a zero-sum game. And that's really important. 
because one, one, one way to look at it is that art is a, a message from an artist to a number of people, receivers, fans, someone they want to communicate with. And, and, and to say something interesting means actually adding something to the conversation. So you need to say something that's not already been said, and you need to have people that understand what you're trying to say. So if you, my, my theory is that if you, it's not mine alone, um, if, you, if you say something really boring, you might be able to say something that everybody likes a little. That's fine, but it's never going to create like some artistic revolution, right? The people that do artistic revolutions tend to have really small groups they're communicating with, right? They're saying something that those people get, and there's something new to be said. It might be about politics, it might be about love, it might be about culture, right? And so like AI is not doing that right now. I mean, there's, there's no cultural embedding, there's nothing there um, that, that gets us there. And furthermore, like, you know, it is about our culture and our lives, right? So, you know, the classic, you take a, a war hall and put it in a time machine to 12th century France, that message is probably too revolutionary, they won't get it. Um, and the other thing is that like, artists will, will push the boundary on things and break things. That's part of the same story. If you're not breaking things, then you're not actually saying something new. And so I think our real hope is that we see a kind of transformation take place with these technologies where they become artistically important because artists have made them artistically important. Um, and so I'll close with one of my favorite quotes from Brian Eno, and I think it's relevant for this discussion. Um, and it's about exactly this idea of transformation via breakage by art. Whatever you now find weird, ugly, uncomfortable and nasty about a new medium will surely become its signature. CD distortion, the jitteriness of digital video, the crap sound of 8-bit, all of these will be cherished and emulated as soon as they can be avoided. It's the sound of failure. So much modern art is the sound of things going out of control, of a medium pushing its limits and breaking apart. The distorted guitar sound is the sound of something too loud for the medium supposed to carry it. The blues singer with a cracked voice is the sound of an emotional cry too powerful for the throat that releases it. The excitement of grainy film, of bleached out black and white, is the excitement of witnessing events too momentous for the medium assigned to record them. That's Brian Eno, and my hope is that we break AI in exactly this way. Well, big thanks to both of you. And uh, since I know we have a lot of people online and in the building who want to ask questions, I will get one in uh, somewhat quickly and get out of the way uh, for those questions. But since we're talking about the arts and AI here, you know, one, one thing that uh, really connects both of your presentations with what we heard in the last panel, particularly from Sydney, uh, it takes me back to Ralph Ellison. They got all this machinery, but that ain't everything. We the machines inside the machine. Right? We're seeing that on the representation side, we're seeing that on the actual inspiration side, we're seeing that in the practices. So imagine this question coming from some combination of Ellison, Joel Dinnerstein, who in his book on uh, jazz between the world wars, uh, talks about music and other forms of the arts as survival technologies. Mm -hmm. And Dinnerstein says that while uh, we were in a shift from an agrarian to an industrial age, Jazz specifically, and, and various forms of black expressive cultures created the nation's survival technology. So imagine Ellison and Dinnerstein with Missy Elliott, Missy Elliott, not with Timbaland, we're not gonna touch the Timbaland news. <laughs> Missy Elliott and Janelle Monet. Since to go back to your metaphor, Doug, we're all going to be hiking on Wednesdays. So when you think about music and when you think about the arts, what are some of the kinds of survival technologies we're going to need collectively to make it through all these things breaking and all these avalanches? Mm. That's an incredible question. Um, so the survival um, technologies and strategies. So I think one that's already kind of been engineered within black speech is mm -hmm. signifying, right? Absolutely. It's the speaking on multiple registers. I think that enables a kind of constant evasiveness, mm -hmm. like that's built, encoded into the ways that we speak and understand the world is always kind of speaking in a register that the kind of dominant lens can't fully account for. 
Um, Even when fully in that gaze. Right, right in the spotlight, right? Yeah. Like in slash visible. Right. So I think, um, you know, I, I feel hopeful in many ways because, because of the rate at which we sort of, um, we as in like black speech folks who, who speak, who, who work within this, this like tradition mm -hmm. of communication are constantly re-engineering new ways of communicating. Absolutely. Like it's, it's a, a kind of like cultural art form, cultural practice. Mm -hmm. um, I also think, um, you know, getting really clear on uh, distinctions between community and audience mm -hmm. Um, I think starting to Facts. kind of surface some of the discussions around how we distinguish what those those things are, yep. um, and I'm I'm not sure what that means in terms of the the kind of critical technologies or tools that we we formulate to make that distinction. But in my mind, that's what we need to get clear on that Wednesday that we're hiking um, to to really develop the sense of of who's looking in and who are we kind of in collaboration with. I love both layers of that answer. Doug, what would you like to add? I love that answer. I would add uh, that it's a, it's a trajectory. It's a sequence. So the, the analogy isn't that bad, right? If an avalanche happens, I believe the survival thing to do is to try to stay above the snow and point your feet downhill, right? You don't try to stand. You don't try to stop. You don't try to fight it. You ride it for a little while. And I think that there's some necessary riding the technological flow for a little while, but not for too long maybe late Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> and once you can stand, I think what we need to do as a community is, is in some ways move the Overton window where we need it to be. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think a strong voice, a strong united voice that says, for example, we don't accept that we regenerate the voices of, of uh, here's a great example. We don't accept, perhaps, that we regenerate the voices of, of artists who've passed away. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a very simple one. Like, the, I'm not saying we should or shouldn't do that. I'm, not, I'm coming here with it, but I think we could move into a place where, wow, if you did that, you've you violated some artistic and cultural norms. And I think we can set those norms. It'll take time, but setting those norms is as important, I think, as as the legal battles that we'll see unfold. Mm -hmm. And so my answer is, it's let, let it you know let it flow through for a little bit, ride it, but then let's let's work together to build the 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 the, the, the culture we want to build. Mm -hmm. For sure, thank you both for that. And so we'll go to a question from the remote audience. Uh, Jim Salzman, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Should 11 Lab style voice cloning require a license from those whose voices are cloned? Hmm. I if mean, it's my voice, I want, I want to license it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the dialogue that has taken place today has you know, illuminated that consent is Again, coming from this sort of like hip hop tradition around sampling, I, the, the should, I feel a little, I start to sweat a little bit because I think about what creative possibilities are foreclosed around that. But um, I think absolutely if an artist wants to, a person or an artist wants to move forward in that way, I don't, you know, I wouldn't say that they, um, they're, they're the person to whom they're responsible, mm -hmm. that voice is responsible too. So, um, I think, yeah, with the question of licensing, yeah. if the person says my voice, I want my voice to be used in this way, I don't, I'm not, um, I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I like the way that the end of your response spoke to or at least uh, suggested various ways in which artists might agree to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so let's, let's go to the in-person audience. And first of all, I'm happy to see some of my students from Science Technology Society 200, <laughs> Funk and Teleki, Science, Technology, and Black Vernacular Cultures in the building. Uh, glad you're here. Uh, but yes, anyone uh, in, the, in the physical room who has a question? Yes. The, yeah, Michael, come over to you, John. Hey, Professor. <laughs> um, <laughs> so as... Um, as AI gets better, how, how does it threaten the art form of hip hop? And what can we do to protect uh, the art form? Also, a, another thought that I had is like, wh how does this um, take away opportunities from up and coming rappers? Um, and lastly, uh, 
I guess, I guess it's a three-part question. <laughs> You're an academic already. Let's give you your PhD. <laughs> and uh, I guess the last part would be, um, would we need like a Spotify AI where we could just listen to music um, and generate, like, let's say Kendrick Lamar takes another five years to drop an album. Uh, <laughs> he's my favorite rapper. I said, well, what if I could just, you know, say, oh, well, make me a new album and I could listen to a new Kendrick Lamar album every day, so... Mm. So I'll start with the last one. I'm not into that idea. Um, <laughs> last one. Because um, I think there's a, there's a general kind of disrespect and um, lack of understanding about the creative process. And so you know, when an artist takes five or six years to work on something new, the idea that you should, you're owed something, you're owed a piece of work in that window, to me, speaks to the disconnect that we as consumers have, or listeners, or you know, folks who are engaging with material, to the artistic process or to creativity more broadly. So I'm, I'm not at all in favor of, of that sort of approach or that lens. Um, again, I'm, I'm anxious about foreclosing creative possibilities. Is it possible to think about, like, oh, what might it sound like for Kendrick Lamar to mm -hmm to um, you know, be on this beat that I produced. <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm still hesitant about that, but I feel less so than the idea that, well, they're taking forever to make their next project, so like, I got to make something to fill that, that yeah. gap. Um, as far as like, what the, the, the sort of like challenges are, or what we're, we're up against for um, MCs, I mean, again, I think what I spoke about with with signifying and this kind of like brilliant language, <laughs> rhetorical technologies, I think you know part of the reason why AI Drake is so successful is because human Drake has been really <laughs> successful, right? Like it's building on a, a catalog that has already kind of articulated a really important voice, um, which tells me that that voice and that person and that artist has a lot of meaning, which is then, of course, like extracted to be able to make a product from that, but that the, the artist who, like if Drake wasn't Drake, if Drake was some dude, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sure that the music would be very catchy, but there's a whole persona, there's a whole mythology, there's yeah. a whole relationship to his artistry that I think informs that. So I am, um, I think, I have hope mm -hmm. that specifically within hip hop where the, the person, the identity, the, idiosyncras the idiosyncratic, the authenticity for better or for worse is so important to how we understand what an MC is mm -hmm. that I think that, that helps us to kind of lean into the human space in a way that maybe other art forms might be um, facing challenges around the identity of who the performer is. Like yeah. even, you know, ghostwriting is still very much <laughs> frowned upon, right? Like even though it's- Done so heavily. Yeah, it's done so heavily. Hip hop is popular, it's pop music. So there, of course there are scores of teams who are often writing a lot of the music we invest in and listen to and yet, we still want to perceive that the MC is a singular right. kind of presence. So I think that like cultural location actually can be a protective force around how we view what hip hop is supposed to be. Um, and that up and coming MCs can find their way in a space that still prioritizes that type of like way of being as an artist. You want to add anything there, Doug, from the some do, the some, some woman, some them folk uh, part of that question that, that we just heard? Um, you know, I, I love how you talked about the sort of protective bubble that might be possible, but for, for those artists who are not going to have the social capital, the financial capital, the access to large corporate protection, be that with legal teams or crawling bots or whoever, um, what might emerge to be able to protect some of those artists? Oh, um, <clears throat> I think I'm hoping that we'll see kind of a, some sort of gold standard marketplace emerge that's open to, to artists of any, at any tier. I mean, we've, we see some version of that with, you know, with SoundCloud and, and with, mm -hmm. it's not perfect, it's far from perfect, right? And, and YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, you know, beyond that, I think it's, it's, it's still really a big open challenge. I don't, I don't have answers, and I think we should have answers, but we're not there now. We're not there yet. I, I would point out, just in terms of like protecting, whether it's hip hop rap or whether it's another genre, genres seem to be pretty, actually most genres are, pretty resilient to technological change. 
like classical music is still here, <laughs> right? Like, like if people want to keep it, we'll, we'll keep it. I, I, think, I think the fact that, that the technology opens up new paths does not necessarily mean that you know, old paths get shut down. The counterexample is, right. is, is silent film. There's very little silent film made, but OK. There's very little silent film made. I don't know what to say. Right. Then we're talking about technological and human ecosystems as these shifts occur. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. right. So we have time for one more, uh, hoping we could take it from someone here in the room. I've got someone on the side here. Pardon? We're, hope, we're hoping questions not from the little speaker, the guided speaker section. Oh, well, oh, uh, right, the person I just uh, shouted out is not in the invited speaker section. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Please he, stand if you're willing. <laughs> yeah, oh, hey, Michelle. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Am I Yo, okay please to ask continue. Yes, you are. Okay, all right. Cool. Yeah, so one of the things I've really liked about text to image models like Stable Diffusion or Dolly is that someone like me who isn't particularly artistically talented, who doesn't have, you know, doesn't have a sense of how to do shadows or lighting or whatever, mm -hmm. can just type in a text prompt and get in a relatively nice artistic result out of it. And so what that means is that me with some aesthetic opinions but no artistic techniques mm -hmm. can produce some nice artifacts that people can appraise as, you know, very nice and they can choose to hang it up or whatever. So that's <laughs> sort of enhancing the marketplace of that. So the reason why I'm bringing up this analogy is that, you know, as someone who also isn't musically or vocally talented, but has opinions on what good music is, if I construct a good set of lyrics, now a text-to-speech model can generate, you know, a voice that is very much, that can sort of take the form of what I've written and express it in a very nice way, could that be viewed as sort of like democratizing the access to, towards generating music that could be overall kind of good for the music landscape, assuming that you have like, you know, copyright attributions to the original voice? Like, I think it could be potentially viewed as increasing the accessibility for artists who don't necessarily have the talent, but have sort of aesthetic opinions on what makes good artwork. So thank you for that, that um, question provocation. Um, you know, what's interesting, when I first um, asked ChatGPT to craft me a verse in the style of a, you know, I think it was Jay-Z, ChatGPT said, responded back, you know, this is a complex art form and I wouldn't dream of teaching you how to try to rap. And if you want to learn, you should listen and practice. And um, you know there are a number of great resources and artists that you can listen to to um, understand the art form. So I think you know this. This was brought up earlier. This use of the word democratization and thinking about what sort of is being democratized, at, like at what cost. And like we can't erase questions of power, particularly within the hip hop context, around who is um, like what access means to that space. Um, who uh, doesn't necessarily have sort of cultural access or whose language and um, way of being contributes to the sort of like broader pool but doesn't allow them access to show up or be visible in the same spaces that an artist who doesn't, who isn't, you know, black or who isn't poor, or who isn't coming from a certain background won't sort of have, uh, benefit from that democratization, if that's correct, if that's sort of, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, of course I'm excited by tools that allow folks to think about the, the beautiful artistry engaged within hip hop music and culture. Um, but I worry that it doesn't sort of, the, the pathway that you're, you're talking about um, sort of further disconnects artists from a culture that is already been so extracted and Absolutely. so, um, I'm getting emotional, that has, has um, suffered so um, in the way that black musical forms have right across, yes. across American history, right? And so I'm protective in a way that, that um, no, no, I don't want to foreclose creative possibilities, but I do want to encourage cultural and historical awareness. And I don't think that sort of that relationship to the music making um, necessarily makes that pathway easier. I think it makes it easier to sort of um, pick and choose and build a menu and not have to connect with the folks from whom this culture continues to be sort of um, stripped of uh, uh, 
economic and cultural meaning for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's applaud that. <laughs> yeah. That's just it. Uh, no, that was a mic drop moment. <laughs> Thank you for that amazing panel. Wow. Thank you. Also, thank you, Adam. <laughs>